Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. I'm back from my Equinox break and ready to delve into sci-fi and fantasy topics with an emphasis on, of course, steampunk. This week's video was from an idea suggested by viewer M. Davis 9311 so thank you very much for that. The suggestion was to do a book versus movie comparison of the famous steampunk work the Prestige. Now, that's going to be the first question I con consider. Is the Prestige steampunk? As I said, this video will be a review, a book versus movie comparison of the Prestige. And first of all, to the question of, is the prestige steampunk? Well, I'd say yes and no. In the sense, the larger sense, that steampunk should be some kind of historical extrapolation or modification to the actual history. In, you know, for example, having airships in common use in the 1890s instead of the 1930s. Uh, so in that sense, it's not, because there's no major changes. However, in the sense that there's a sci-fi fantastical condition to the story that the story depends upon and it takes place in the Victorian era for the most part in that sense it is and there's one more consideration is that I should have mentioned this in my elephants of steampunk video any story any fictional story that involves Nikola Tesla is by definition steampunk and this story does indeed involve Nikola Tesla. Uh, so a little bit of background. The Prestige it was a novel by Christopher Priest, a British sci-fi writer. It was written in 1995 and it got a lot of critical acclaim. It won a World Fantasy Award and, and also the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, whatever that is. In 2006 it was made into a film adaptation by Christopher Nolan a very well-known director who's got a lot of great films under his belt. And it got Academy Award nominations, but I don't believe it won any. Uh, best Art Direction and Best Cinematography, which it definitely deserved. One of the considerations on this steampunk work, <laughs> which I'm going to call it, is how good of an adaptation is the movie uh, relative to the book. And now, this got me to thinking, what makes a good adaptation? Does it have to be really true to the plot? Well, it should at least be somewhat true to the plot, but is that the most important thing? And I've decided, no, that's not. And I was thinking back to a, another work that I may sometime do a video on. It's the 2003 manga series, Death Note. And it was made into many adaptations. Some of those adaptations were good, some were terrible. There ended up being a Japanese live-action adaptation of Death Note. They changed the plot significantly, but I didn't mind it because it was true to the spirit of the book. That is, I mean, it was the book being the manga in this case, in that was this something that the protagonist, the anti-hero in this case, was that something that he would do? And I'd say yes. So in that sense, it was true to the spirit of the book. It's also true stylistically that there is a sense of supernatural dread that's involved here. Now, how about the prestige? Well, we'll see. We'll see how it measures up. The story is essentially the same in both the book and the movie, but with important uh, differences. And I should note that uh, Christopher Nolan and his brother Jonathan, who wrote the screenplay, they encountered the book while on a tour promoting a movie, and immediately fell in love with it and wanted to do an adaptation. So here's a case where the filmmaker really did want to do a good job. And I also have to say that the the finished product, the writer Christopher Priest was impressed. He wasn't angry about this misinterpretation of his work like Alan Moore, <laughs> the uh, graphic novelist who always always seems to denounce the adaptations I guess he still takes takes the money. <laughs> but anyway, let's delve into what is the central meaning, what is the central plot point 
of the prestige. It's about two 19th century stage magicians, Rupert Angier and Albert Borden, and their rivalry which becomes a deadly, bitter, hateful feud. And one of them is an aristocrat. Angier comes from a wealthy aristocratic family. Borden is a working class guy and he wants to move up in the world. And magic is his way to do it. Now the book is framed in the sense of a meta story about their great grandchildren, uh, one from each man, who basically discover their diaries and they are trying to solve a mystery. The great granddaughter thinks she witnessed a murder as a small child and she enlists the help of the great grandchild of the other man who is a journalist and try to figure out if this murder really happened. That story is completely absent from the movie and it's understandable because the movie is a shorter medium. A book can take you hours to read whereas a movie you have to consume it in two to four hours before your tush gets tired. And I'm going to give some warnings here. Pretty quickly I'm going to get into spoilers. A lot of you might not have seen The Prestige. You probably haven't read The Prestige so I'll warn you now that I'm going to get into spoilers completely. And so if you don't want to know, go and read it first. In any case, um, the basic premise is still there. Uh, the feud between the two magicians which becomes more and more over the top as it goes on. So a little bit more about that. The magician Borden happens to wrong Angier in some way in both the book and the movie. First there's like more of a friendly rivalry. In the book they are basically acquaintances and uh, Borden is offended by something Angier is doing and so he inadvertently harms, harms Angier whereas in the movie it's also portrayed as inadvertent but possibly extreme negligence. Anyway, this leads to them playing pranks on each other. They're trying to discover each other's secrets. It gets worse and worse and worse until it becomes murderous in intent. And uh, Borden has created a trick called the transported man, which is nobody can figure out how it's done. He appears to teleport himself from one cabinet, and, and from a closed cabinet into another, and nobody can figure out how he does it. In practice, the only way to do that is by using a double because there's no way he can get into place quickly enough even if he goes through a trap door and back up through another one and so the, the deal is that everybody who sees it is convinced that it's the same man coming into one cabinet coming out of the other so Angier becomes obsessed with discovering the secret the movie and the book handle that secret differently in the book we find out the secret not near the end. I mean, well into the book, but not near the end. So the reader knows, or at least strongly suspects. Borden's secret is something Angier discovers, but in the book he is pretty certain, but he can't prove it. Whereas in the movie it leads it to the end. And both Angier has a secret too, because he develops this duplicate of Borden's trick through a totally different means through the use of technology. And this involves kind of a, a terrible secret as well. And this is where Tesla comes in because Angier, in desperation to duplicate the trick, uh, goes to the United States to enlist the aid of scientist Nikola Tesla, who has been talking about teleportation. He is successful in convincing Tesla to build him such a device. And he's actually teleporting. <laughs> Here's the sci fi aspect. And in both cases, both men used electricity as part of the act. I mean, in Borden's case, it's to have lightning bolts and so on to obscure what he's doing. And in both cases, it escalates and, and eventually leads to tragedy. Now, there's many differences between the two. A lot of them didn't strike me right away because I saw the movie first and about 10 years later, I heard the audiobook. And so that difference was one of them. The book reveals some of the secrets earlier. And you, re you also find out Angier's secret right in the beginning. <laughs> right in the beginning you find it out. Whereas you don't necessarily quite understand what's going on in the movie. Uh, the grandchildren, of course, aren't in the movie. They 
are part of the story, a meta story for which there's no room. The class differences between the two magicians are kind of played up in the movie in, in the fact that uh, Borden talks in a very working class accent, whereas as in the book, his language is pretty close to that of the of the other magician. He's kind of an aspiring upper class guy. In the movie, Angier, played by Hugh Jackman, he sounds almost American. And I don't believe Jackman's an American, so it's kind of interesting choice. Uh, but the idea is that he's trying to sound cosmopolitan. And the the uh, other one, Borden, played by Christian Bale, he sounds working class. Very fantastic stellar performance by both. There are other differences include the same characters from the book have greater roles and different purposes in the movie. First is Angier's ingenieur, <laughs> French term for engineer, because he's rich enough to have an assistant who is his name is Cutter, and he is played by Michael Caine in the movie, and he has a very significant role in the movie. In the book, he's kind of a side character. And the other one is Olivia, who is a assistant. In the movie, she serves as assistant to both men, and she's kind of a conduit where they try to spy on each other. In the book, she is Angier's mistress for a while. So regarding the tragedy that starts the feud, in the book, uh, Borden uh, interrupts one of Angier's performances causing a ruckus which causes Angier's wife, who was part of the act, to miscarry. She was pregnant. They were doing seances essentially and, and of course they were phony and they had, that had offended Borden. And uh, in the movie, Angier's wife is part of the act and she actually dies because Borden has screwed up his uh, tying of the knot. He's actually part of the act. He's actually, they're actually cohorts or uh, on the same team and so in this case it's you know even more embittering. In the book, Angier's wife survives. They do have more children and he has a very happy home life until he encounters Olivia in America. And she's kind of a tempting little morsel. In the, in the movie she's played by Scarlett Johansson who looks very fetching in her magician's assistant outfits. There's also the changed role of Cutter in the movie. He kind of serves as Angier's conscience and he also explains to the audience a lot of what's going on in because of his knowledge, because of his technical expertise. The climax is in both stories as well. Uh, whereas, where Borden attacks Angier essentially. In the book, Borden interrupts the power while Angier's machine is in the midst of teleporting him. This causes Angier to be split into two people, which is kind of like an old plot of Star Trek, if I recall. And both, both uh, succeeding personalities are damaged. They're both less than fully human. This is ironic because this is a, a mirror image of what Borden's actual secret is, which is Borden is twins. He has actually been two people the whole time. He has he has hidden this so diligently that even his wife didn't know. Essentially, she was married to two different guys. Very scandalous. And in the movie, she knows that sometimes her husband loves her. She can sense it. And sometimes he doesn't. Because one of the twins actually loves her, and the other loves Olivia who comes to work for Borden. In the book, she has a much more minor role. And I think Tesla has a little bit bigger role in the film as well because it's played by David Bowie, which is funny because you think this very eccentric musician playing this eccentric scientist. It actually kind of fits, and Bowie does a good job. He's got, you know, a little bit of a mild Serbian accent, and He's not on the screen that much. There's a lot of a lot of time in the movie where they're in Colorado, and 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 Tesla is working on the machine, but you don't see him very much. And they say that Nolan actually flew to New York to convince David Bowie to play the role because he wanted him so badly, and Bowie wasn't really interested. But the result was 
very good in the sense that Bowie was in it. And so in the movie, we have a different climax. And it's in, it's in the old formula of climax first, then we'll do the backstory, and then we'll move beyond it. In, in the movie, Borden is spying on Andrew. He can't figure out how he's duplicated his trick because Borden is twins. You know, so one of the Bordens is there investigating, and he sneaks backstage, and he's watching while Angier falls into this tank of water and drowns. And so he's suspected of murder. He's accused of murder because the two men have a well-known rivalry and uh, eventually convicted and hanged for it. And it turns out the secret is that Angier is, has duplicated himself. He's let one duplicate be killed so that the other can extract revenge on Borden by framing him for his own murder. In the movie, Borden eventually dies of sickness because he's, well, you, the implication is kind of that he's tortured by what he's done, how he's harmed Angier, and he isn't caught and punished, though, in this case. In the movie, he did nothing, <laughs> and yet he's, he's convicted. And the other thing about the movie, which is interesting, and I found a little implausible, perhaps, is the idea that the Borden twins, one twin is in prison, the other is free in disguise, and the twins don't come out with their secret. They take it so that one of them goes to the grave, and so that the other twin is alive and free to take revenge on Angier. Now the funny thing is that you think, well maybe if the twins had come out it would have reopened the investigation and they might have cleared the other twin's name. On the other hand, they might have arrested the first twin for conspiracy. So, who knows? Maybe it's not that implausible at all. So, as you can see, the thrust is different. E even though the general, the general soul of the movie, the spirit of the movie, is the same. It's about unbridled ambition and rivalry and hate, and it turns to tragedy. And the style is definitely very much the same. The wonderful Victorian setting, and which is in both the book and the movie, and the characters are there, so the plot is substantially the same. So I would say this is a stellar adaptation of a book. But finally, the one difference that I think really stood out in the movie was the use of the prestige term. It starts with Michael Caine explaining, there are three acts to any good magic trick. One is the pledge in which the magician makes this promise to the audience of doing something mysterious and magical. Two is the turn in which the uh, audience is misdirected and uh, all these things happen. And three is the prestige in which the, the, it's the payoff, essentially, in which the trick is performed, the audience is dazzled and mystified, and all is good. However, in the book, that's very, very minor. It's just a little mention. I believe it's in the Angier section. Uh, well, there's a setup. And, and he doesn't even use the word pledge. Well, there's a setup when you set it up, and there's basically all the, all the uh, process of doing it, which is, involves the trickery and the me me mechanical devices and whatever, and finally the payoff, which we sometimes call prestige. <laughs> so it's very disappointing. It really frames the movie. Uh, the re repetition in Cage's inimitable style at the beginning and the end and the use of these rather wonderful mystical sounding terms. And that had me hooked in the trailer. I, when I saw that and I heard those three terms, I thought this is like the entrance to another world and this makes me want to see the movie. And so they, both of these steampunk works are fantastic. I would give them both five of the five gears, even though nothing is perfect. Maybe out of the five gears, one tooth is missing. <laughs> That's how good they are. On the other hand, which is better? I think I like the movie slightly better. And it's because the movie is more linear in the sense that it, it jumps around less. It gets to the point sooner. And the tricks being more brutal, the events being more tragic, I think that makes more of an impact. So please let me know what you think about this review, this book versus movie review of The Prestige, in the comments below. I'd also appreciate other suggestions 
and whether you liked or not. And I appreciate you watching. Thank you very much for being viewers. Please like and subscribe because that helps us get out the good steampunk gospel. And for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.